Okay. So um, what we're going to talk about this month is matching text. And what I'm going to show you is implementations of a parser for the, um, a simple structured line of text. And here are my little test cases that I have. So these, let's see, uh, all of these are valid that I've highlighted. So this is a line of text. Um, a marker in graphics terms just represents a symbol that you place on the screen or something. And uh, so it has, you know, in this case, it's just two dimensional. So I've got a uh, two dimensional coordinate for each marker. And the idea is that line of text begins with the keyword marker. And then there's a series of comma separated points. And each point is two coordinates that are separated by commas and surrounded by parentheses. So that's what we're trying to parse. And we're going to look at uh, several different ways that we can do that. And um, although I haven't made these implementations like 100% bulletproof, I, I drilled through them enough to show you the different approaches. So, um, so these are my test cases. So this one here, the keyword doesn't match. This one, it has the keyword, which has to be followed by a space, but then it doesn't begin with an open parenthesis. Here it's the same thing, but it's just multiple spaces. Here we have the open parenthesis, but it's, it's not a complete point definition. Same for all of these are not complete. All of these that are highlighted are not complete point definitions. This is our first one that uh, looks like it might be complete, but it's missing the comma between the two coordinates. This one is the first one that is syntactically valid for what we're trying to match. And uh, always with uh, writing parsers, I mean, I, I could write a, a recursive descent parser by hand that turned, you know, um, a sequence of characters into a token. So this might be the first token that you'd see, which is the marker token. And then usually things we're parsing, the white space is not significant, but that may vary. It may have significant white space. So then this would just be characters that are ignored and then an open parenthesis token, and then a number token, and then a comma token, and then again, more white space that's ignored, and then a number, number token and close parenthesis token, etc. And then you take that stream of tokens and feed it into um, a parser that recognizes that the, the structure of your input means that the tokens have to be arranged in a certain sequence. And <clears throat> a common set of tools for turning a sequence of characters into a sequence of tokens, that is a lexical analyzer. And the classic tool for that is a tool called Lex, which the open source equivalent is called Flex, F-L-E-X. And you write a little uh, input description to Flex and run it through that tool. And that tool produces a C source file that represents uh, a table-driven approach for recognizing sequences of characters as belonging to one of the valid token classes that are specified in your input description to Flex. So that is a standard way that you would learn in a compiler class or something like that of how to take a sequence of characters and turn it into a sequence of tokens where each token has um, an identifying enumeration value and an associated value, which represent the, the value for the token is the string of characters that were matched that corresponded to the token in the token descriptions. And then to process tokens into matching a grammar, you would, uh, again, the classic tool is a tool called YACC, Y-A-C-C, which stands for 
yet another compiler compiler. And the open source, both both Lex and Yak, originated within AT and T when they in their Unix distribution, and that was available to you if you were an AT and T customer and you bought Unix, you would get Lex and Yak available to you. But uh, if you didn't use, uh, if you weren't an AT and T customer, uh, the open source community created Flex as the open source equivalent of Lex, and they created Bison. Uh, as the equivalent of yak, because a yak and a bison are similar. The yak animal, not Y-A-C-C. So the animal Y-A-K. So you would write, again, a description to the tool bison or yak that describes how the tokens are arranged in the structure representing your grammar. And then you run that through the tool, and again, it produces a big table-driven implementation that either recognizes or rejects. Um, it recognizes uh, input text that matches the rules in your grammar, or it rejects the input text saying it does not match. And while those tools are tried and true, it's very painful if you're developing the lexer or the uh, grammar and you're trying to step through it in the debugger because once you step into it it's just a big table driven implementation and you can't really see what's going on so it's it's very difficult to debug your tokenizing by just stepping through the implementation that is generated by lex and similarly it's difficult to debug the grammar that you've created by stepping through the implementation provided by yak or bison and most of the time, uh, learning how to create the proper inputs to those tools to generate that table-driven implementation, most of the time that is overkill. Where it is ad advantageous is if you're doing something like a programming language or some kind of sophis more sophisticated scripting language where you have to look up the values of symbols based on a lexical scope or something like that. So if, if it's complicated, like a programming language or a scripting language, then it's worth investing in those level of tools. But if it's just, I just need to parse a file format, uh, or I, you know, I, in, in my example, I have, it's, it's loosely structured text. I mean, if it were reduced into binary where I had, a, a you know, a binary byte that represented what kind of token I had here, and then just, you know, two binary IEEE 754 floats appearing as 32 bit, binary values after that one byte for the for the marker token. I mean, that would be much more easy to parse, but we're not parsing text at that point. We're just reading binary data from a file. So of course it's easier. So if we have to write <clears throat> something by hand to match some kind of structured input, what kind of options do we have available to us? Well, we can start with tried and true scanf. So here, I've got a scanf style parser that I've written. And to facilitate that, I've got the idea that I'm just have a state machine. And as I recognize each portion of the input, I'm going to advance the state machine through a sequence of states. And You may not have done this before with scanf, but the percent %n scanf format specifier allows you to get back from scanf the count of characters that it has consumed in the input buffer so far. So what I'm doing is I'm using scanf to scan a little snippet of the input string and then I'm having scanf tell me how many characters did you read so far? And I'm using that to identify uh, failed matches and to advance the number of characters that I've parsed with each successive call to scanf. So scanf, you may not have done this before, depends on how much experience you have with scanf. You may not have realized that scanf can match the input string 
against fixed characters as well as characters representing a value. Here I'm using percent %g to read a floating point value in so-called general format. And I'm not, um, <clears throat> I am not giving any field widths in my um, format specifiers or anything like that. So I'm taking advantage of the fact that scanf will skip leading white space when it reads a value. Um, so I start out by looking for a marker, space open paren, read a floating point value, and then a comma, and then another floating point value, and then closing, oops, closing, let's just do it this way, closing parenthesis, and then tell me how many characters were read through scanf. Um, since I requested two values, namely the two floating point numbers, um, scanf returns the number of values that it read exclusive of excluding any percent %n specifiers. So there's two percent %g's, so I'm expecting it to return two values that it read, and I'm expecting that the number of characters that were read should be non-zero, should be bigger than zero. So if the count wasn't two, or we didn't read, uh, or the number of characters read was reported as zero, then that means we didn't match the input. Now, why would you get the number of characters matching as zero? Well, if the um, if the input was correct up to the point I have highlighted, we would have read two floating point values into the, the, the X and the Y using the percent %g format. And then if we didn't have a closing parenthesis, what scanf ends up telling you is count will be two and then num red will be zero because we didn't reach the end of the format string. We did see two values, the two floating point numbers, but we didn't see the closing paren, so we didn't get to the end of the format string. So it's kind of weird in the way scanf returns the value there. You wouldn't be able to identify that the closing parenthesis was missing without checking the number of characters that were read. So if that was successful, we will keep track of the number of characters that we parsed and we'll go to the next state, which is now I've read the marker keyword. I've read the marker keyword and the first point is required, but I may have more points following the first one uh, with arbitrary white space and commas separating the subsequent points from the first one and all between all the subsequent points. So now we're looking for, um, we're going to skip white space before we see a comma. So we're just looking at if it is a space character and we haven't run out of characters yet, then just keep advancing. And we either get to the end of the string or we get to something that is not a space character. So we're going to advance from this white space before comma parsing state to the comma parsing state, which just checks that did we end up at um, a comma? Now you might say, oh, you forgot to check if you ran out of the string. Well, this whole while loop that's switching on state is only progressing so long as we haven't run out of the string. So if we ran out of the string here with optional white space at the end, but no comma, we would have skipped the white space, gotten to the end of the string, and then when we go around this while loop again, the string would be done and we would exit out the bottom saying, okay, I've, I've consumed the entire string and I haven't found any problems, so the parser validated the line of input. So next, after we skip some possible white space, if we didn't get to the end of the string, we're going to check if it's a comma. And if it wasn't a comma, then it's malformed, so we return false. Otherwise, we advance and look at white space after the comma. Same thing, skipping white space and switching to our next state, which is a possible, which should take us to the next coordinate. And the next coordinate does not have a keyword, but it still has the two values separated by commas and surrounded by parentheses.
So we need to do that uh, scanf parsing again to get those floating point values out. And again, just checking for malformed input. If everything was good, we can advance. And then our next state is back to white space before comma. So we will cycle through these states for all of the additional coordinate pairs after the first one. And if we, I've got this set up to run this one right now. So let me do this and get this on the screen so you can see it. So for our scanf based parser, this is what the result of our test cases look like. So these were all negative test cases. So that was all good. It rejected all of the malformed input uh, and it recognized this one successfully. However, it, 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 this is syntactically correct, but it didn't match it. And we will discuss why in a moment. It matched this one, all the, all the coordinates I was giving in my test cases up until this point, they were all integers. So here was a coordinate that had floating point values and it successfully matched that one. And it also successfully matched a sequence of coordinates, but it failed here. So we have two cases that we had valid input, but our scanf based parser didn't match them correctly. And the reason that it didn't match them correctly is because of uh, white space. So in the case of this one, we have white space at the end of a signal coordinate. And in the case of this one, we have white space at the end of multiple coordinates. So this parser isn't perfect, but as long as the input isn't too crazy, it, it got the stuff out. We could work on this parser some more and, and improve it. Um, but this gives you the idea of how you would approach this with a scanf based approach. And <clears throat> it's kind of opaque, right? I mean, and it's kind of, it, it's pretty low level. It's not, when I look at this state machine, it's kind of hard to see exactly, like if I didn't have test cases that gave me both positive and negative examples of acceptable input, I would be hard pressed to look at this implementation and understand what the valid input is that it's trying to parse. I mean, I don't have any comments here that are explaining it, so I can't rely on that. And I learned the hard way not to rely on comments anyway, because the comments are not executable code and they can deviate over time from the implementation. The implementation is what really matters. And if you rely on the comments, you may find out like, oh, somebody changed the implementation and they never updated the comments. And now the comment is misleading. So I prefer to have an implementation that is straightforward and easy to understand for what the code is doing. So I don't have to rely on comments to explain things. Sometimes you don't have any choice, but um, it is what it is. So um, what other approaches can we take so I've got a, a scanf approach. I've got a sturtoke approach. Both scanf and sturtoke are available in C. So they're obviously available to you in C++. I've got a parser using methods on std string. I've got a regex based parser. I've got a spirit based parser. Now spirit is the last one we will look at. Spirit is a library for writing uh, parsers from boost and it's been around for a long time and um, we will look at that one last because that is the most special purpose parsing oriented library approach that we will look at but let's let's switch it over to sturtoke and see how it fares so did a little better it it, it handled this one all right that the scanf approach didn't handle. 
but it failed on these last two. So some pluses and some minuses. Let's take a look at, at Sturtoke and see how parsing using Sturtoke looks. Now, Sturtoke, if you're unfamiliar with it, it has it has a non-reentrant API. So what that means is it's not thread safe. It's modifying global data on each call. So you can't, um, not only is it not thread safe in the sense that you can't have two threads calling into Sturtoke simultaneously, it is not thread safe in that it's modifying state in a global variable every time you call it. So you can't, even if you have two threads that are not in Sturtoke at the same time, it's still not good enough. You have to serialize your complete sequence of Sturtoke calls in a single thread. You have to sequence that and isolate it from any other thread that might be trying to use Sturtoke at the same time. And the reason for that is because the API works like this. You pass it a pointer and a delimiter string, and then it returns to you a pointer to what it believes is constitutes a token based on your delimiter string. So what does that exactly mean? It means that when Sturtoke returns, token points to a character sequence that is null terminated and it is null terminated at the first occurrence of one of the characters in the delimiter string. So in this case, my delimiter string is a single character string consisting of a space character. So this first call will look at this data pointer and return to me a pointer to the first character in a sequence of characters in this data pointer that is not a space. And that character sequence is null terminated. So not only is it using global data, and not only is it not thread safe, it also is modifying my input buffer. It is writing null bytes into my input buffer, which is why I used the data method here. I'm using all C++20 here. So uh, in C++20, the data member on the string class can give you a pointer to a buffer that is writable. Uh, whereas CSTR gives you a... Uh, the question was, how can you quickly find out if a function is thread safe or not? Um, the standard for C++ and for C calls out the thread safety of all the library functions. And because Sturtok is an ancient thing, and by ancient, I mean it's like coming from Unix in the 1970s. That's how ancient it is. Uh, it predates um, threading per se. Like threads weren't even a thing that people thought about in the 1970s. Um, and as uh, is being pointed out in the chat, you can look these things up on CPP reference and there, a, there is a re-entrant version of Sturtoke, but when we get to the end, you'll see that it is just better to use other libraries. <laughs> I'm showing you these first because these are the painful ways to do it. So the, as I was developing this, I mean, I, I honestly had not used Sturtoke much before at all. I have a similar mechanism to the other example that we looked at here. We have a little state machine. Uh, I haven't named the states the same because I developed these all independently. Um, and the difficulty I had with Sturtok is that you have to give it a list of characters that represent the delimiter, not the characters that are in the token, that are valid for the token itself. Whereas when you're using something like Lex to generate a tokenizer, <clears throat> 
you specify the characters that are valid to be in the token, not the things that are not valid. And because I am wanting to allow arbitrary floating point values, I have to do things like, you know, I have to include dot and plus and minus and all the digits and space as valid delimiters when I'm looking for an open parenthesis. So let's take a look at our, our state machine and what's going on. When, when stirtoke exhausts the input string, it returns a null pointer. So right away, if I couldn't find something that was separated by a space, remember our, our valid input is the string begins with marker and then it requires a space before the list of coordinates. So if I couldn't find even a token separating or separated by a space from other text, then we already know that things are not in the right form. So as long as I can keep getting a token, I'm going to switch on state and my start state, the very, the very thing that we should have gotten from this very first call to stir token should have been marker. Now I've used the user defined string literal um, to I've, I've used the standard user defined literal for a std string so that I can just compare against this care star. This will be care star will be in, implicitly converted into a string and then the operator, the comparison operator will compare us to std strings. Just so I didn't have to use like stir comp. I'm not, I've never been a fan of, of the stir comp API. I found, find the code to be less obvious than just comparing std strings. So if the very first thing we got wasn't the word marker, then it's again, invalid state. Otherwise we will continue looking for the next uh, token, which is a left parenthesis. So what's weird now is I have to look for, so if I tried to use stir token and gave it the delimiter as open parenthesis, what would happen is it would write a null byte over the open parenthesis and it could be that the first open parenthesis it found was much later in the string rather than right here where I need it to be. So stir token is kind of weird. I'm looking for a left parenthesis, but instead of, you can think of it as like a string split function more than a, than a tokenizer because I have to give it the delimiters that I don't want to see in a weird way. So after the parenthesis, uh, you know, I'm expecting normally to see digits making up a floating point value uh, optionally with like, you know, a decimal point and you know, signs, plus and minus sign. So I'm, sp I'm looking for the next token that doesn't have digits. If we didn't find anything, we're just going to um, advance to the, the through the, the, This give me a way of getting an easy out of the while loop. I'm just breaking out of the switch so that when we go around the next time the while loop, it will be no pointer. We'll break out of the while loop. Then I'm checking that the token is an open paren, and if it's not, it's bad state or uh, not recognized according to our grammar. And then we're going to advance to the x coordinate, and similarly throughout all of this parsing. And I didn't find I, um. So I mentioned that stirtok is using global state and the first time you call it, you call it with a non-null pointer for the first argument. And then to advance through the subsequent tokens in the same string, you repeatedly call it with null pointer as the first argument and whatever delimiter you're looking to separate tokens by as the second argument. So I just having to think of like the opposite of what I'm scanning for made it counterintuitive to me to use stirtok. I think stir token is more suitable for something like where the input is much simpler and in structure. Like if it's just a, a, a series of comma separated values where the, uh, the comma character can never appear in the value itself. 
then start token is great for that. You just keep splitting on commas, or maybe you allow commas or spaces or semicolons to separate your values. A, a simple loop through Sturtok would be just fine for that. But unfortunately, our structure that we're trying to match is more complicated. So I have to do more work. And again, just remind ourselves of the results. It, it doesn't even work that great for what we're trying to do. I mean, it worked on three out of our five valid test cases. And again, I could spend more time improving it and, and make it work. And I'm obviously constraining myself to not writing a character by character recursive descent tokenizer and parser by hand. I'm trying to use library functions to get the work done. And so far with scanf and stirtoke, I have had to do a lot of extra work maintaining this, this state machine myself. And the resulting code is not clear. It's not reading this implementation as kind of, you know, 70% sufficient as it is, it's still difficult to see what the valid form of the input is. So maybe we should just get away from C library functions like scanf and stirtoke, and maybe we should just use standard strings and see what that looks like. So let's go back over here. I will switch to our next implementation using std string. And we'll just show you the results real quick before we look at the implementation. And okay, this is looking good. We got success on all our valid inputs and all our invalid inputs were rejected. So that's good. That's better than what we had before. So let's take a look at what it looks like for std string. Uh, again, I have to maintain a little state machine as I'm walking through the tokens. And if you were to use the approach I'm showing here for uh, high performance parsing or parsing tons of data, you would not do what I'm doing. I am being lazy. I am, every time I recognize a portion of the string, I am erasing it from the beginning of the string. So that means every token causes a portion of the beginning of the string to be erased, which usually means that the string data gets copied around. Now it's all contiguous in memory, so it's probably hot in the cache, and it's probably not, you know, a huge penalty for a small parsing job. I'm going for simplicity of implementation rather than efficiency of performance. We will address performance in a little bit when we get to look at our last example. So this is correct, but not the best. Um, but I'm trying to stay away from low-level things like maintaining um, a character pointer that represents, you know, the, the current beginning of the string that I'm parsing. Um, it, that was kind of unavoidable with the C library functions because there's C, they're C library functions. They don't have higher level data types like std string, so I can't operate there. So using this approach, it's a little bit clearer. I can see that, okay, uh, we have to have a marker and then some white space that we will skip. And then it has to have an open parenthesis. And I've written all the states in the case switch statement here so that they, they follow the order of the parsing. So the next thing we will do is use S to F from the string header. So S to F comes from from C++'s string header. It's a global function. Takes a std string as the first argument. Returns the parsed out floating point value. It can also give us a count that represents the number of characters that were consumed in the input in order to successfully parse the floating point value. If the parsing fails, then it will throw an exception, which is something to be aware of. It, that throwing exceptions on bad input may be a no-no for you. Maybe you're doing embedded code or something and exceptions aren't allowed or coding standard doesn't let you use exception handling error mechanisms, whatever the case may be, just be aware when you're looking at functions in the standard library, always consult 
the documentation for what exceptions it may throw. In this case, there's like a bad value exception they can throw when the string contains text that can't be parsed as a floating point number. And there's, I believe it will also throw an out of range exception when the value represents an acceptable sequence of characters for a floating point value, but the value is too large to be stored in the representation of a float. If either of those things happen, we're going to return false. If we advanced zero characters, we're going to return false. Why would that happen? That would happen if the string was empty. We haven't explicitly checked anywhere in here if the string was empty. On success, we're going to erase those characters from the front of the string and advance to the next state, which is all these states here are very similar. So again, skip some more white space, look for a comma. If we found it, erase it and go on to the next state, which is another floating point value. It, it, it's identical to what we saw for the X coordinate. And then finally, skip some white space. We're looking for a closing parenthesis and we may have more coordinates after that complete coordinate that we just successfully parsed. So we will now skip some more white space. If it's, if the string is empty after skipping white space, that just means we ran out of coordinate pairs and we successfully matched. So we can return true right away. If it was a comma or then if the next non white space character after a complete coordinate is not a comma, then that's an error that's malformed. Otherwise we will erase that comma and then go look for the next coordinate pair with open print. So this parser using S2F and using methods on std string like erase and starts with allowed us to write a simple parser that correctly matched all our valid input strings, rejected all the invalid input strings, but it's still this kind of big messy state machine and I'm doing all these string manipulations. And if I was to, had to parse, you know, a so-called big data data set, this would be dumb because of the amount of string shuffling that's going on just to parse tokens out. So not bad. We got at least correctness. That's always good, right? But not the best in terms of understandability. So what about regexes? Let's go over here and switch to our regex implementation. Run this and see how well this regex does. So, okay. It rejected all the bad ones and succeeded for our positive test cases. So let's go look at the regex implementation. Now, regex, pretty heavy machinery in the sense that the regex class is not a small class in terms of its implementation size. And here I'm not even um, caching the result of the regex construction. So the regex class takes a string that describes the regular expression to be matched and it has its own parser that parses the regex string into a sequence of tokens that it recognizes as the valid grammar for regular expressions. And it does all that work every time you construct the regex object. There's a way to amortize this so that you construct it once. Um, you notice my regex is not dynamic. It's a, it's a constant string. There's ways to amortize this so that you uh, do what's called a compilation of the regular expression into an instance of the regex class. You do that compilation once, especially in this, like I've done here where, or that would be a good idea for what I've done here, where the regular expression string itself does not change at runtime. So there's no point in rebuilding this Every single time I try to parse a string, I could build this once and then use the regex to match the input text over and over and over again from the same compiled regex. <clears throat> now, 
in my case, the thing I need to match contains parentheses, which are significant in the language of regular expressions. A parenthesis that is not escaped represents a capture group in regular expressions. And the C++ standard even has multiple flavors of regular expression grammars that are acceptable. Uh, here, I view, if you wanted to specify which grammar you wanted to use, it would be a second argument to the constructor that would appear here. I'm just using the default, which I believe is ECMAScript regular expressions syntax. Uh, you can choose between ECMAScript and POSIX and several others. So I have parentheses that need to be matched in my input string. And because parentheses represent the structure of capture groups in regular expression syntax, I have to escape the parentheses with a backslash. Now, the backslash itself has to make it all the way down to the regex library. I'm using a raw string here. So if you're not familiar, C++11 introduced raw strings with this capital R double quote is the beginning of a raw string. And then there's an optional raw string delimiter and then a mandatory parenthesis. So all of this is the opening part of a raw string literal. And then the closing part of the raw string literal is down here with closing paren and then that same delimiter text repeated and then a closing double quote. And it's kind of hard to see, but my IDE is highlighting this in a slightly different color than it's like a little bit more red. And this text here is kind of a little bit more brown. But while this again, it got us a concise implementation that completely rec recognized all the valid test cases we had, and it rejected all the invalid test cases we had. But man, that's really that that's really a, what I call uh, a shotgun blast to the face of punctuation. It's hard to really see what's going on here. Um, there are tricks that you can use to um, eliminate some of this duplication. You might notice here that there's a bit of text that is in the regular expression that is repeated here. And then it's repeated again down here and a fourth time. And if you look more carefully, you'll see that this entire thing, if I search for it, uh, no, I didn't think I did it right. Let's try this. You can see that that entire sequence of text is repeated twice. So what we're really trying to say here is it has to be marker. And then in regular expression terms, a plus represents one or more of the previous items. So I have a space plus that means one or more spaces. So there must be at least one space, but there can be any number and it will match. Then I have an escaped open parenthesis. So I have to have an open parenthesis and then asterisk in regular expression syntax means zero or more. So I have marker at least one or more spaces, a literal, op literal open parenthesis, then zero or more spaces. And then I have a capture group around this sequence of characters that is either, uh, that is one or more characters from the set of minus plus zero through nine and dot. So those are all the characters in a floating point value. As long as we're not using um, scientific notation where you specify E and the exponent. So simple floating point values, then zero or more spaces again, then the literal comma zero or more spaces again, and then another capture group, for the second coordinate, which is again, a sequence of characters from this set, one or more characters from that set, then more optional spaces, and then another closing parenthesis. Then all of that can be followed by more optional white space, 
And then what I've done is taken that whole chunk of regex that specifies a sequence of zero or more additional coordinates, each separated by a comma. So that whole thing is that I've highlighted is one big regex that has a star after it. So it means that there can be zero or more of those all at the end. So while this works, it again, rejected all our invalid strings and accepted all our valid strings. You might be asking, like, how do you get at these these uh, numbers that were matched? And that's what the uh, smatch class does, is it captures the match. So when you call regex match from the regex library in C++, the first argument is the text to be matched. The second argument, there's overloads. This is the overload I'm using. The overload here is to capture the result of these capture groups that I've used in my regex. And then the third argument is the regular expression pattern to be used to validate the text. And if the entire string matched my input pattern, then this regex match function returns true. Now, obviously, if I were writing a real parser and I wanted to get at the values that have been parsed out, I need, can't just return here. I need to do something with the capture groups. And I kind of cheated because I haven't attempted to further parse out that this capture group, it just, all I've written in the regex is that it needs to have one or more characters from this set of characters listed in the square brackets. However, not all of the sequences of characters that are described by this regex are valid floating point literals. It's only valid to have a single decimal point in a floating point literal, but the regex that I've written allows you to match just a sequence of dots. That's not a valid floating point literal. So there's additional matching that I haven't done here that I would need to parse out uh, these matches from the capture groups to validate that the coordinates were indeed valid uh, floating point values. And I could add a test case for that and show you real quickly if you want to just convince yourself that it doesn't work, but you can just take my word for it. So what we're bumping into here is that scanf wasn't designed for complex parsing of arbitrary structure against, you know, uh, some kind of grammar. It's meant for simple things like just read two floating points, two floating point values separated by white space. That's the kind of thing scanf is used most for. Sturtok, again, difficult to use for this problem because we're kind of using the wrong tool for the job. Sturtok is really better at things like comma separated value, where you have input that while it is has characters that serve as delimiters, it's value, delimiter, value, delimiter, value, delimiter. It's not, and the delimiters are the same between all of the values. It's not, in, it's not really meant for complex parsing like this. Um, and again, regex, uh, you, I mean, if you Google around, you can find a regex that matches all the acceptable character sequences for a floating point value and rejects invalid character sequences. I just didn't happen to Google that. I just put something simple in here to get my test cases passing. So while you can find those regular expressions that correctly accept and reject all valid floating point character sequences for, or all character sequences for floating point literals, it would just make this regular expression even more unwieldy. And without, um, let's see if it gives me a way, it, I don't have the reverse to transform this raw character literal back into a plain character literal. Let's just do it manually. So if I take this out, now I have to double up all these backslashes. This is what we lived with before we had raw string literals. 
Let's just run this again and make sure I didn't mess anything up. Okay, still passing, so that's good. But now it's even uglier because these backslashes are all doubled up. And if I had even more parentheses that needed to be quoted or other characters that were significant to the regular expression grammar that I need to have appear as literals in my input to be matched, any of these characters that we've shown, plus, star, um, I haven't used it here, but also vertical bar is significant to the regular expression grammar. And my little blank tidy here is telling me this string is long and ugly and has lots of backslashes in it. We can make it a little easier with a raw string literal. So again, regular expression, good for simple matching of like a single value. Difficult to, uh, to have uh, an obvious implementation or it's, uh, you know, looking at this, it's, it's unclear to me exactly still what is being matched by this regular expression. Now it's all in one place. So at least it's not sprinkled across a state machine that expands over like, you know, two screenfuls of code, but still pretty impenetrable. And this, and again, classic tools for parsing at uh, an advanced structural level are Lex and Yak which we could use always, nothing wrong with that. But Lex and Yak also has its own language. Each tool has its own language that you use to describe tokens or to describe expressions in the grammar. And so that's another language you need to learn. Not everybody has learned it. Wiring it into your build system can be, you know, a little tricky if you're not, um, you know, up to snuff on your build system. I think for most C++ developers, the build system is a tolerable nuisance, not a thing that they enjoy spending time in. So, and, and you need, if you're going to use those tools, Lex and Yak or Flex and Bison, you need to wire that into your build system so that whenever you change the input description for your tokenizer or the input description for your grammar, that those are reprocessed by the secondary tools to regenerate the source code and then have that source code compiled and brought into your build so that you don't have the problem of like you changed the grammar, but then it didn't get picked up in the implementation. So I've kind of been hinting that really where we want to go is we want to look at Booth Spirit. Now I've switch it and we will look at the implementation we will look at the results and then we'll go look at the implementation okay so boost spirit rejected all the malformed inputs accepted all the correctly formed inputs so that's good let's take a look at what that looks like now spirit is a header only library and it, we've done a presentation on Spirit, but it was like five years ago. So uh, probably Charles is the only one that was there for that. But I, Spirit is a large library in the sense that it has a large surface area of tools for writing parsers that can not only recognize valid inputs, but they can also parse out the values and create you know, um, what in compiler terms or in uh, parsing terms is called an attribute. So when it parses out the value, when it parses the text to match it against your description, it can give you the values that were matched at the same time. So kind of like the way, uh, let's go back to the regex example real quick. So kind of like the way when you match with a regex, the regex matching function has a way to give you back the values that were matched inside capture groups. In Spirit, there is an associated semantic attribute with the rules in your grammar, which we'll look at in a second. Uh, I haven't used that here. I'm just matching that the, the text has the right form, but it is not difficult to add the 
additional code to pull out the parsed values. Okay, so in Spirit, the chi header here, qi, chi.hpp, that is the brings in all the machinery for parsing. And just to simplify some of the representation here, I've got some namespace aliases because it's the true namespace is boost spirit chi. I'm going to use some ASCII characters that I'm going to match. So I'm pulling in boost spirit ASCII. And the way spirit works is you write a grammar class. The grammar class is templated by the iterator type that you're going to use to iterate over the input. So I, I could iterate over tokens or I could iterate over characters or I could iterate over whatever, you know, cause spirit being a header only library, it's all template classes. And there's no thing that says that you have to iterate over characters as you're matching elements of the input sequence to your grammar. You could iterate over tokens. You could iterate over whole strings. It, it, it doesn't, actually matter as far as chi is concerned. So my grammar derives from a chi-based grammar of the same iterator type. And my constructor tells the chi machinery the place where my grammar starts. In, in this case, it's a member variable I've got called start. And then I'm just bringing in some symbols from the chi namespace and the ASCII namespace here so I don't have to fully qualify them when I write out my my rules. So if you've worked with grammars before, and maybe you haven't, so we're going to talk about it a little bit. And this is similar to what you would do if you were using yak or bison. You describe your valid structure using one or more rules that say this name on the left of the rule is matched by a sequence of stuff on the right side of the rule. Now, in yak or bison, you write that rule in the description language of yak. In chi, in spirit, what they're doing is a so-called <clears throat> expression template mechanism. So they're exploiting the fact that you can write a so-called domain-specific language in C++ itself by leveraging the types of the elements in the expression so that you're composing machinery by using the... Um, type matching and template argument deduction from C++ templates. So let's just unpack that to see what that means. So here I've got a little rule for a coordinate. A coordinate is an open parenthesis followed by zero or more space characters followed by a floating point value followed by zero more space characters followed by a comma, followed by more white space, followed by another float, followed by more white space, and then ending with a closing parenthesis. So even if I don't understand how spirit works, and even if I don't understand um, template expression mechanisms used in to implement a domain specific language, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can just look at that and I can see like, okay, whatever this is doing, it looks like a coordinate is a sequence of stuff in this order. And then my start rule is this it says lit. So that sounds like it's a literal, the string marker followed by, in this case, it's a plus. So just like in regular expressions, a star 
is zero or more, and a plus is one or more. So now it's I have to have at least one space followed by a coordinate followed by what looks to be this whole thing is in parentheses. So it's zero or more of whatever is in the parentheses. And what's in the parentheses is white space and then a comma and then white space and then another coordinate. And we can have white space at the end. So pretty concisely, I'm able to specify the structure of a coordinate and the whole thing that I'm going to parse is the word marker followed by at least one space and then, <clears throat> and then, excuse me, at least one coordinate followed by more additional coordinates, each separated by a comma. And we can, so our, our iterator, we said before that these grammars can operate over whatever iterating sequence you want. In our case, we're just going to use the const iterator from std string as our iterator because that's our input is a std string. So we'll instantiate our grammar over that iterator type. And we're going to iterate from the beginning to the end. We're going to call parse, which is a function from spirit that takes a pair of iterators iterators, but it modifies the first iterator. So that's why this first iterator here is not const. The end is const. It's, parse is not going to change the ending iterator. But what parse does is it walks over that sequence of um, values expressed by the pair of iterators and uses the grammar to parse that sequence and tell you if it matched. So if result comes back true, it means that the input that was consumed matches the grammar description that we have. And so my extra check here is to say that not only should it match whatever it consumed, but it should have consumed the entirety of the input for it, for it to be considered valid. And you might ask like, why does it have an API like that where you have to do this extra check? And the answer is, you can break up a very complex parsing problem into smaller grammars that parse portion, sub portions of the, of the entirety. And then you can compose them so that if you uh, successfully parsed the beginning of the string, according to the grammar for the beginning, then you can switch to a different grammar and parse the remainder of the string. But in our case, we have a, a simple grammar that describes the entirety of the accepted input or acceptable input. And <clears throat> that gives us this implementation using spirit. Now, <clears throat> this is admittedly can be a little confusing to somebody that is unfamiliar with domain specific languages embedded into C++. However, it's not uh, too different from regular expression syntax, namely the, the plus and the star for one or more or zero or more items. And it is very, very similar to the kind of input that you would pass to Bison to describe a grammar. The main difference being that um, C++, the syntax of C++ itself forces these operators that specify the multiplicity of a, of a value to be prefix operators rather than postfix operators. When we looked at the regular expression syntax, we saw that the, the star came after the thing that was to be accepted zero or more times, and the plus came after the thing that was to be accepted one or more times. Whereas in spirit, because we are still restricted to the, even though it's an embedded domain-specific language, we're still restricted to the syntactical constructs provided by C++ in terms of what operators we can overload. And there 
left to right associativity in C++. So there's in C++, there's no such thing as a postfix star operator, right? That's, that's sy syntactically invalid. Um, there's also no such thing as a uh, unary postfix plus operator. There's, there's plus plus, but not a single plus. Whereas we can have a unary prefix plus operator that we can overload. So in spirit, some of the syntax, namely that these multiplicity values end up going on the front rather than at the end, <clears throat> are moved around because of the rules of C++. But this is pretty close to what we would have written if we were using a tool like Yak or Bison. And unlike Bison, if I, for whatever reason, I'm having difficulty with my grammar, getting it correct, and I need to debug into it, in Bison, you're out of luck. You, the only thing you can do is step into the implementation, but the implementation is a big table-driven mess. And it's, unless you um, really understand the table-driven implementation strategy of a parser or a lexer, you're not going to be able to make heads or tails of it. Um, even though it, it, they do have some tricks for associating lines in your input description file with lines in the generated source file, it's still almost impossible to debug through that stuff. In Spirit, there is a lot of machinery involved, but when you step into something that's in the implementation of Spirit, it is a source file written by a human, not written by a machine. So it has comments and it has assertions. And if one of your uh, grammar descriptions is wrong, it happens to compile, but it results in a runtime error and you hit the assertion. It's been my experience using Spirit that the assertion is documented with a big block comment is saying, if you get here and the assertion fails, it's probably because you did X, Y, or Z. And that is very useful in going back and correcting errors you might have in your grammar. Now, because Spirit is a header only library and the only machinery that gets pulled in is what you actually use, it can result in an extremely efficient parser. And one of Spirit's claims to fame is that the parser for parsing an integer when generated with Spirit is faster than the C library routine A to I. And you might say to yourself, you know, how is that even possible? And the, the answer is because the amount of inlining that is made available to the compiler gives the compiler opportunities to optimize more of the code globally. Whereas when you call a C library function like A to I, may not even be something that the compiler has visibility into. It, for instance, if you're on Windows and you're using the DLL form of the standard library, well, A to I is a compiled thing inside another DLL. It's not something whose implementation at a low level is exposed to the compiler so that it could do more optimization and inlining. So for parsing data in a very performance sensitive environment, Spirit is a good choice, and we didn't lose anything in terms of being able to clearly see what it is the structure of what we're trying to match in our input. Um, I mentioned earlier, when we were looking at regular expressions, that this big string has to go through its own little regex parser and turned into an internal data structure, and that process itself can be expensive, and we have to pay for the runtime overhead of everything in the regex class, even the stuff that we're not using. However, there is, um, it's not quite ready for use in the sense of uh, a completely, being completely standards compliant, but there is a compile time regex library that is out there. And <clears throat> if I'm, um, correct in remembering the current state of affairs, 
with C++ 20, it still requires a few little const expert tweaks to things in the standard library that didn't make it into C++ 20 in order to have everything with regards to your regular expression be compilable at compile time. And what, what I mean by that is with a compile time regex library, at compile time, your regex description is parsed at compile time. And again, they use um, template expression mechanisms to expand the parsed uh, regex string into an implementation of some code that matches your regex. And because that expansion from regular expression syntax to code is done at compile time, rather than building a piece of runtime machinery from parsing the string at runtime and then going through a state machine to recognize the input. Uh, well, it's a, it's a generic state machine because it has to handle all possible regular expressions and, you know, syntaxes and so on. So a compile time regex is an option. If you have input that is easily matched by a regex and you need to process tons of input, I would highly recommend looking at the compile time regex library. There's been a bunch of videos at CPPCon and other conferences over the past several years about this library as it evolved. And um, I believe it is supported with uh, Clang and GCC. I'm not 100% certain about MSVC um, because, again, the evaluation and parsing of that regular express, expression syntax string is done at compile time. So it needs to have compile time mechanisms available to it. And that means const expert functions or const eval func const eval functions and so on. So things need to be evaluated in a compilation context in order to get the most benefit. But it gives you the powerful power of regular expressions for matching input and allows you to get a highly efficient implementation out of the compilation process. In, 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 and by, by that, I mean the process of compiling your C++ source code. And it can result in a regex matcher that is quite small. It's only as large as the machinery that you're using in your regular expressions. So you're not paying for what you don't use and it can be very efficient. Um, in, 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 in the uh, presentations on that library over the past couple of years, they've shown different examples where they went from thousands and thousands of machine instructions and the resulting binary, maybe down to just like a couple of hundred. So it can significantly speed up regex matching. So if you have input that is suitable for regex and you need to match a ton of things, I would strongly recommend looking at the compile time regex library. It, it's not really any different other than how you in, you know, invoke things. It's not really any different than what I've written here in terms of how you describe the regular expression. Um, however, if you have more complicated input structure that needs to be matched, then I think Spirit is a better solution. Spirit is designed for parsing. It only does parsing. And it, it because it's using a uh, embedded domain-specific language in C++, I don't have to go to another tool. I don't have to learn the syntax of another language per se, I still need to learn the constructs of the spirit library. But it, once you get some experience with it, it's really not that difficult and gives you an implementation that due to the nature of inlining and template classes being a header only library, it can give you an extremely efficient implementation. So that's all I've got for the presentation. If there's any questions, we can go to those. You need to do audio or chat. Okay, well, 
since there doesn't seem to be any questions, I will stop the recording. A couple of people have said that Spirit is good for medium, small to medium sized parcels. Um, not sure why. Um, well, if it were larger than a medium sized parser, what were they saying that you should use instead? Uh, I don't think they, they're saying anything particular. But. I, I mean, a lot of people, when they think about parsing, they think like, oh, this is great. I could use this to parse C. Oh. <laughs> but C has many context sensitive uh, syntactical elements. And over time, as they've enhanced the grammar of C++, it has obtained more of these context-sensitive keywords. For instance, the keyword final or the keyword override. In order to maintain backwards compatibility with source code that used the words final or override as variables, ident namely identifiers, right? Yeah. To prevent that code from breaking, they made the keywords context sensitive. So the keyword is only valid when in, at certain points in the grammar. And there are a number of things like that in many programming languages. And the end result is that tools like Spirit or tools like Bison can't correctly parse the whole language. So every compiler for C++ has a handwritten recursive descent parser that recognizes those context sensitive keywords only in the contexts where they are allowed. Um, I, I, you know, I've been hanging around the spirit community for more than five years and, and I'm unfamiliar with anybody saying it's not suitable for large grammars. Okay. There, there are a lot of tools in the Spirit toolbox, and it is easy to code up a grammar that is stupid. And it's so, in other words, um, I can always creatively find a way to create an implementation that doesn't perform well with any tool. Oh, yeah. Especially when I'm comparing it against a handwritten parser where I'm micro optimizing everything. Yes. So, while I haven't heard that objection to Spirit, uh, it, there's there's always going to be some scenario where handwriting something will be faster than what Spirit does. But Spirit does pretty well on performance and uh, readability of code. So, and 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 those two things are competing forces at many times, right? Sometimes. What you have to do to achieve the necessary performance does not result in clean, simple code. Simple in the sense that it's simple to read. Yes. I mean, what I'm showing here in this spirit example, this is pretty simple to read. It's resulting in quite a bit of stuff happening at compile time and resulting in code that I wouldn't call it bloated, but it, the you know it's doing quite a bit. And so um, I, I suppose it's possible that I could, you know, for any library or tool, I can always come up with a case where is it, to achieve my necessary performance goals, I'm going to have to, you know, write something by hand. But um, as I say, I've been hanging around the spirit community for five plus years now, and I'm not, I'm not aware of any case where it just, you know, completely falls down. Um, I will give this a try. I was trying to use some, uh, basically, uh, Rust parsers, but yeah, I will try this. If, if, if your yeah. inclination for a parsing problem was to use, like, say, Flex and Bison, I would say give Spirit a try. Oh, yeah. Because um, it, it's really comparable to Flex and Bison. I mean, I'm sure there are cases where Flex and Bison fall down and oh, yeah. a... Not just for grammar reasons like C++'s grammar, for instance, but from performance reason. I mean, as your grammar gets larger and larger and larger, those data tables in the implementation of a table-driven table solution like 
flex and yak or flex and bison um those tables get larger and i could easily see a point happening where the table gets to be too big to fit in cash and now it's slow but not because the implementation is dumb but because it's having interactions with the memory hierarchy yeah so i think you know, for my reasons to steer clear of flex bison is like debug ability it's just nightmare to figure out what went wrong <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's very opaque if you have to step into the implementation. I, I've done it, and you know I survived, but it's not a voyage I would recommend if you know for the faint of heart. Um, that's not to say that you know Spirit being a large library. That's not to say that stepping through Spirit is obvious what's happening. But at least it was written by a human. It's got comments. It's got assertions. And there's also, um, it's been around long enough that there's a large enough community that if you get really stuck, you know, there's places you can go and get help. The same is true for Flex and Yak, for Flex and Bison. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I, I mean, those tools have been around for you know 50 years at this point. So there's, there's plenty of people that you can go and, you know, get experience with. But when you're on your own, just like stepping through it in the debugger, uh, I've stepped into both and... I'm not saying it was obvious what was going on in the implementation of Spirit, but at least I could follow along. Um, any other questions? Okay. Wondrous has something on the chat. Uh, chat window is off screen. Could you um, oh, error handling? Sure. Could you? So the question is: Could you comment on the error handling and reporting in Spirit, i.e., parse failures and generating usable error messages? So, uh, I mean, here I've done a simplistic. You know, did we consume all the input? You know, just reporting success fail. Um, however, there, you know, error handling is as in terms of generating useful error message to, you know, somebody that's typing in, a, a, you know, text that you're matching, you know, in other words, the, the thing that you're parsing didn't come from another machine. It wasn't JSON generated by another machine or something like that, but it was human input. The amount of diagnostics and error messaging that you, that you get is as good as what you invest. In other words, spirit just, matches and tells you whether or not it matched the input matched your grammar and when it didn't match uh at all it gives you um that false result from the parse function and if it matched a portion a portion of the input up to a certain point it tells you that by the fact that it didn't advance the input iterator all the way to the end now there are um facilities in spirit for enhancing your grammar to provide more useful error messages uh, in, in certain scenarios. But um, it's not like it has a specific error reporting facility, if, if you understand what I'm saying. That to improve the diagnostic error messages when the input string doesn't match results in an investment by the application developer. It doesn't come from spirit for free. So for instance, if you have um, noticed that there's a repeating error from human input where they used a comma instead of a semicolon, you could enhance your grammar to recognize the erroneous use of the comma and then note the error scenario and throw an exception or or do whatever you want to do in order to mark the parsing as failed but having made note of a common mistake so that you can give a more useful diagnostic it, it sounds similar to bison or yak yeah it's yeah. no better or worse than those uh okay. There's another question. Is Antler a good option for C++? It works well with Java and Go. Um, 
this is an opinion? And my answer is no. <laughs> so is it good? Have you tried it? I, I never tried it with C++, but it's, so, uh, it, it's very easy to use, actually. It, it is, but um, I'm, and you can, I would recommend like consulting opinions you know, or discussion on Stack Overflow. I mean, technically, Stack Overflow doesn't allow you to post opinions. Okay. The answer's right. Um, but um, the general consensus is it's more trouble than it's worth uh, for oh. C++ developers. Now, I, I've used it. Used it is probably overstating. I've experimented with Antler in small scopes, and I found it difficult to use. Um, I think Spirit is a better fit for a C++ developer. But again, that's an opinion. I'm not stating it as a fact. There are people who like Antler and use it from C++. I don't happen to be one of them. Okay. It's not a bad library. I, I just didn't find it a good fit or natural for C++. Um, if I recall, Antler is sim more similar to Bison, and that requires you to run a separate tool to generate the parser from the description. Yeah, it's generated, but you, you, you have only just one file where you put the lexer and the parser, right? Like lexer rule and parser rules, but it has some advantages. Like you can generate an abstract syntax tree. You have the concept of a visitor, at least in Java and Go. I mean, it makes so it easy to work with the grammar afterwards. Like, So I didn't show it in my example with Spirit, but in Spirit, every token that you're matching mm -hmm. every element in your, in your rule here. So, I mean, space, that's just white space doesn't really matter, but the, uh, float parser has an associated attribute with it because float matches something that is not a fixed string, right? It matches right. a floating point value. So when the float parser executes in spirit, there is, an attribute associated with that, and that attribute is of type float, and it has the value of the floating point number that was parsed out. And mm -hmm. the same is true for, there's a parser for ints, there's a parser for unsigned ints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's all the intrinsic data types in C++ can be parsed out by the built-in parsers for those data types in Spirit, and they all have the associated, what they call attribute with that parser. Now, in Spirit, they have the ability to combine the parsed out attributes from these primitive parsers and synthesize attributes that represent the combination. So here, you know, I've got a representation of a coordinate that has these string literals and the white space. And the two things that really matter are these two floating point values. And in Spirit, there's machinery to automatically create the attribute of coord from the two attributes of the two floats, and it would automatically synthesize that as, say, a stood pair of float and float. Okay, so it's so going to be... Yeah, so, yeah, that, yeah. so that becomes the synthesized attribute for coord. And then here, because I've used uh, repetition, the synthesized attribute for the part that I have highlighted is a stood vector of coord. Mm -hmm. And it's smart enough to recognize that you often have lists of things with delimiters between the elements in the list. So it further recognizes that, oh, the thing on the right has a synthesized attribute of stood vector of chord, and I've got another leading chord on the front. That really means to just synthesize one stood vector for everything. And the synthesized attributes give you a way to quickly create an abstract syntax tree representing all the values that were parsed out, but in a form that uh, just does it for you, if you will. It's kind of auto magic. It's the way, it's what they recommend. They recommend using the synthesized attributes that Spirit will construct for you. But if that's not suitable, for instance, you need to uh, 
parse directly to an application specific data structure that might be legacy or something. So you can't just arbitrarily change it to a stood vector of chord and the chord can't just be a stood pair. It has to be a particular struct and maybe that struct has to be packed into linked lists or what, whatever your application specific data structure is. It's possible for you to say, okay, the synthesized attributes that spirit creates for me don't really map correctly to my application data structure. So I'm going to use a little annotation to specifically pack my application specific data structure and build it up from the values that were parsed out by spirit. And in fact, um, let's just show that really here. Uh, think I'm not sure if I oh I might need to do this let's see if this is I got a squiggle here I don't think this is gonna work quite right um I'm not doing it quite correctly but the oh, so Oh, you can add actions. You this can, is, yeah, is, you can add an yeah. action associated with each parsing. So parsing. every one of these things is a grammar by itself. So float underscore is a grammar that recognizes the structure of floating point literals, including you know scientific notation and so on. And you can associate an action by using square brackets after an, any grammar, and you have available to you. Uh, Oh, so that's why you use the placeholder, because uh, that was one of the questions. What is the placeholder? Yeah, I had it up here, and I, I just dropped it off because I didn't end up using okay. it. So this um, is the user. That's nice. This but is the... it, it, this, this is all described in the Spirit documentation, which goes through a sequence of tutorials that you know start out simple and then get more and more elaborate and more and more uh, involved and show you how to take advantage of the synthesized attributes for the built-in parsers like float underscore and how those um, synthesized attributes of the nested non-terminals in a larger rule get combined into the synthesized attribute for the whole rule. And then uh, if you need to do something specific when a particular piece of input is matched by a parser, you can attach the actions with the square bracket notation um, and the, I mean, what I've written here, this is what Spirit does already for you. So this is actually redundant. Um, and then as you have your rules, building up your abstract syntax tree that represents all the values that you parsed out of the input, the result of your grammar is uh, there's a, actually a second Per template parameter here. If we go, in fact, if we just drill in, we might be able to see it. Okay, so the grammar has an input iterator and then up to four um, types that are associated with the abstract syntax tree that was parsed out, the, 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 some, the, the attribute that resulted from that little grammar. So you can see examples in the spirit documentation. I didn't want to clutter it up too much and get too down in the weeds because like, like I said, spirit has a lot of machinery and I just wanted to give you an idea of the gist of it rather than, you know, get lost in all the details of spirit. But the recommended practice is to use the built-in synthesized attributes for the primitive parsers like float underscore, and then spirit will automatically, uh, build those up into larger aggregates like std vector or std pair, and then use that as the synthesized attribute for the entire parsing result. And things like if it were, you know, zero, you know, I could either have a floating point value or not, then they would pack that up into like a std optional of float. So you can tell if the float was present and so on. They they have uh, explanations in their documentation of the synthesized attributes and how that propagates up the grammar rules to give you a synthesized attribute for the entire result. Mm 
And most of the time, you don't need to write your own semantic actions and hang them off the parsers. But if it's necessary, you can do that. Any other uh, questions? Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now I think we can really end the recording.